Okay, hello um, and uh, welcome to our webinar on menopause transitions in the workplace. Um, so my name's Vanessa, we're going to introduce ourselves first. My name's Vanessa Beck, I am a senior lecturer in work and organisation at the University of Bristol. Hello, I'm Andrea Davis and I'm a senior lecturer in the University of Leicester. And I'm Deborah Garlick from henpick.net um, and menopauseintheworkplace.co.uk and author of the book Menopause the Change for the Better. Okay, uh, so first things to say is that we've been asked to uh, talk about three ways in which you can participate today. So you can ask questions. Um, uh, the link is below this presentation, somewhere there, I see, I don't know. <laughs> Um, you can answer the polls. Uh, I think a few of you have already started doing that and please do carry on answering those poll questions. Uh, and you can comment and chat and click on say something nice, bottom right, or if you have questions, that is all part of it. So um, please do engage. We'll come um, back to the questions at the end and uh, try and answer the ones that we can answer. Ones that we can't answer, we'll go and uh, add some information later on in the resource section. Okay, um, so today uh, we've got um, we've got a whole uh, list of things that we'd like to talk about. Um, this is kind of a, an outline of um, our, the structure of, of what we're going to talk about. It might be that we meander a little bit backwards and forwards um, as we interrupt each other and, and talk about it, but that gives you an idea of what we're going to do uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so before we come back to the questions. So, talking about uh, menopause at work. Um, so, how, came, how come we uh, are interested in the menopause? It's perhaps not the most obvious thing to do, especially when you work in, in academia. Well, um, three of us, and that's Andrea, another colleague of our, ours, Joe Brewis, who's now at the Open University, and myself, um, over two years ago now, a bid for some re some money from the Government Equality Office uh, to do, write a report about um, menopause transitions in the workplace. Um, and we quickly realised that this wasn't just a report that you write and then move on like you would normally do with a lot of academic work. You do a project and move on. We quickly came to feel quite passionate about it. Uh, and felt that we wanted to do more about this subject matter, um, partially because we were um, involved as uh, women ourselves, uh, partially because we spoke to women in the workplace who were either angry or passionate or troubled by the experiences, and we felt that it was important to do more in this area. And then there was a lot of serendipity. We got together with uh, Deborah here and Sue Fish, who was uh, formerly the chief constable of Nottinghamshire Police, also happened to be an alumni at the University of Leicester. And as a team, the five of us, we have done a lot of work, both in terms of academic research, but also in terms of the types of things that we want to talk about today, uh, practical things. Um, and this is reflected in terms of the media attention that uh, menopause at work has been getting. And I assume you will have seen quite a lot of this in, in the media. Um, a lot of it is good. A lot of it is good coverage in the media. Uh, Organisations that have implemented policies or guidance, and, and Deborah will talk a little bit about this later on. Um, uh, Toolkits that have been put in place, so uh, TUC Wales t uh, toolkit is already in the resource section of the uh, TUC education web pages. Um, the Women's Business Council has also got such a toolkit. Uh, various groups who've been interested in uh, talking with us about the subject matter or who have implemented policies. But you will probably also have seen some of the very negative co coverage. Um, Ben Broadbent is our favourite, I think. Recent favourite. Recent favourite, very mm. true. I wonder if he's watching. Oh, that'd be nice. Um, so uh, him describing uh, the uh, economy as menopausal was uh, interesting, shall we say, and had quite an outcry 
on uh, social media in response, mm. which was good to see. So that gives you a flavour of the kind of uh, attention that the subject matter has been getting. I think it was also really good because it really called it out that menopause has stigma, that it is the unspoken, mm. it's taboo, it has all of these um, unconscious associations mm. with it. And it just called it out in one mm. moment. It was great to see that level of attention. So that's what we've been working with yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. And people who you wouldn't have thought suddenly spoke up yeah. for women and the menopause and that it shouldn't be used in this particular context, which was great. Okay, um, so in terms of um, why this subject then is important in workplaces, um, there's four reasons, four issues that really kind of drive the subject matter um, to be uh, crucial for, for all of us in the workplace. Uh, probably none of this will come as a surprise to you, but it, it summarises it quite nicely for us. Um, there's a demographic case. We all know that uh, society is ageing um, and that in terms of the workforce, uh, the largest growing group within the workforce is women uh, 50 plus. Um, and that means that it affects most workplaces. Um, I think the statistics on that one are interesting because we're already at the stage where one in three of workers in the workplace are over 50. And uh, the Department of Work and Pensions have flagged that because we're an ageing population, we will very shortly be in the situation where the number of vacancies in the system are double the number of school leavers. Uh, so Age UK are doing a big campaign to say, look after your older workers. Um, but then what we want to be doing is, you know, organisations need to be future proofing. Mm. I haven't met one HR person yet that's told me it's easy to fill a vacancy. Mm. So mm. this is something that all organisations need to have on their radar. Yeah. I love that comment um, from um, a colleague in a paper that she wrote about and she said it was the next tsunami that's about to hit mm -hmm. HR because yeah. we haven't got our workplaces future-proofed for the yeah. ageing population and also to be able to account for some of the impacts ageing have in the workplace including yeah. menopause. She was specifically talking about menopause. Mm. Great. Um, so on top of all that, on top of the tsunami, um, <laughs> Uh, is also a legal case and again you might have seen uh, some of these there was uh, now six years ago we said yeah we 2012 this. wasn't it yeah was the uh, merchant versus bt uh, case where mrs merchant brought a, um, a case against her employer bt for um, discrimination and unfair dismissal um, because she had uh, produced a doctor's note that uh, said that she was suffering from the menopause and that this was a, would affect her concentration and her performance at work and had been dismissed anyway. Uh, and the court found in her favour because it actually that action on the part of BT actually violated BT's own mm -hmm. equality uh, guidelines and, and legislation. Um, and more recently, there's been uh, a case that we've been discussing at quite some length. Uh, this is Davies versus the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Services, who um, was working in court and had um, uh, cystitis powder um, that was then drunk by somebody else. And there was a whole kind of uh, set of circumstances that led to her being labelled as unprofessional and was therefore dismissed. Uh, the problem was that uh, she won her case, which is great, um, but uh, the basis on which the court ruled, not the basis on which she brought the, tr the case, but uh, the basis on which the court ruled was disability. And that's where we have a slight issue uh, with yeah. this case. I think there's two issues, isn't there? One, that um, society is a condition that is experienced by not just menopausal women mm. um, although it was due to her other menopausal symptoms so the whole case is about menopause but 
menopause isn't a disability. Menopause, we've talked about it so yeah. much. Menopause is a natural phase in every woman's life, whether that's a cliff edge menopause because you're having treatment for cancer or whether it's a phase that you naturally go through at the time when it um, is your time to experience the menopause. And a bit like pregnancy, mm -hmm. menopause is not a disability and neither is pregnancy a disability. No. It's an interesting case though, isn't it? It's it's kind of landmark in mm. the um, uh, for, for menopause in the workplace because um, other cases have been on age and sex. Um, did, um, menopause always had the potential, and we talked about this getting on for two years ago, mm. it always had the potential to be um, a dis classed as a disability because of the length of time that some women at the Faculty of Occupational Medicine say symptoms can last four to eight years and we know some women can experience severe um, symptoms but I think it's worthwhile um, uh, when we say um, menopause for this case is a disability it's worthwhile making clear that that is the legal terminology mm -hmm. Menopause is a natural phase. It is. It should not be classed on a day-to-day -day basis as a woman experiencing a disability. Mm -hmm. That's that. That's actually you used the word earlier. Um, problematic for us. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing about these legal cases, we've got two there that were lost by organisations, but we're also aware of ones organisations who have um, won mm -hmm. tribunal cases. And when we're looking at, or when an organisation's thinking of implementing menopause in the workplace the best um, the best uh, practice um, would help any organization avoid being in this situation I'm thinking here of Tiffin versus Surrey police mm. where the, um, the, the the leadership team the line manager in that particular case followed their own process was treated um, was demonstrated that they were treating the um, Tiffin with respect as a human being and as a reasonable employer and made appropriate reasonable reasonable adjustments um, so they actually won the case so we, 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 we do know what bad looks like but we, we can also start to it's uncharted territory but we can identify what good practice would look like in this space too mm. and I think good practice is important there but it doesn't over uh, come the problem with the Equalities Act where you are, have to choose whether to go on age, gender or disability. And what we know from the research we've done with companies, academic research, talking um, with experts, is that menopause is a situation where um, gender and age are coming simultaneously. We might use the term it's intersectional with both um, yeah. as sectors. So again there's some work potentially to be done in how we um, legislate around this area. Yeah. From a union rep's point of view when they have discussions with their line managers, their colleagues and we're saying why is me menopause relevant to workplaces and union reps it's to, to avoid organisations getting themselves in that situation mm -hmm. I would suggest. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. Um, so social responsibility case, this is uh, linked to uh, findings that uh, good work, not any work, but good work is uh, also beneficial to individuals in terms of well-being, in terms mm. of esteem, all those kind of things. And therefore, looking after your employees is just the right thing to do. So you know, this is an, a pretty obvious one to, to have on the list. Um, and you made the comparison early on to maternity leave, mm. that it is just a normal part of of uh, human life and uh, a woman's kind of natural um, stages in her life. So therefore, it is just the right thing to do. Mm. We're not advocating a menopause leave, though, are we? No. Sadly. <laughs> or the crying rooms, which I feel slightly cringe-worthy about as well. Yeah, the, the ones from Knott's Police at the yeah. beginning of the year, which weren't true. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yes, okay. But, but employers do really benefit um, from this part, don't they? The social responsibility case, every organisation that we've worked with, mm. um, the um, creation of the right environment to talk about menopause openly, um, has seen a lot of 
praise mm. from colleagues. Right. And improvements in workplace relations, which yeah. um, is, is a beneficial thing for, for both sides. Uh, and the final one, uh, the business case, um, is one that uh, I guess, again, makes sense to everybody in terms of uh, the cost of, of, for example, the legal cases that we mentioned earlier, um, that you want to try and avoid that, mm. that going, having to go down that route. Um, but also in terms of women potentially withdrawing from work when they are struggling with menopausal symptoms um, and the cost of replacing workers, uh, Oxford Economics have calculated this on average roughly around 30k per person who earns around 25k uh, a year. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a significant amount of money that an, an employer would have to uh, fork out both in terms of direct replacement, so just to hire somebody new, um, but also in terms of indirect costs related to training people up, in terms of uh, allowing them to settle in, uh, getting them up to speed, all of those kind of things that cost would include. So if you think of large numbers of certain cohorts withdrawing from the labour force, then that would be very costly for employers. OK, we'll move on to the next slide. OK, so as Vanessa was saying, we um, wrote a report for the Government Equalities Office, which is free to download, and I think it's in the resources section. And in this report, we outline the four cases, the four reasons why employers should take menopause and menopause transition seriously. This was from a global evidence review of all the research in the English language that looked at the relationship between menopause transition, women moving through menopause and the workplace. And what was really interesting was that it's not that menopause symptoms just impact work, but it's also that work impacts menopause and how women experience menopause. So it's a two-way path that needs to be looked at. So we spend a bit of time talking about this. We talk about it with a lot of um, organisations that we work with. And some of the effects of menopause on work are due to the more problematic symptoms that some women experience. So problematic symptoms include things like the usual hot flushes and night sweats, insomnia, um, an inability to concentrate potentially because of being awake at night. There could be a domino effect going on there. There are other issues such as headaches, heavy periods, um, and uh, feelings of fatigue. All of these things can affect how women feel that they're performing at work. So these are usually um, self-reported yeah. um, expressions of how I'm feeling at work, how I'm doing my job. So we see that uh, women who are experiencing some of the more negative aspects of transitioning to menopause, or as Deborah likes to say, achieving menopause. Achieving menopause. Um, I mean that women report a lower job satisfaction, perhaps less commitment to their uh, workplace, less engagement in work. So this is really interesting. Perhaps what's more interesting is that people don't really know what the average age of going through the menopause is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know when we've been speaking in conferences and at workplaces, to make the point that the average age of menopause is 51, and it isn't something that happens in the late 50s or early 60s, that's achieving menopause, which means the transition, the four to eight years before, is a mid 40s um, concern. So here we see that women are um, experiencing menopause transitions and it's impacting work, but often aren't realizing that that's the case. I like that story that you told of, of women who 
um, menopause earlier and a, a woman telling their line manager about their menopause and being told not to be so silly you're far too young to have the menopause so you know that's the kind yeah. of reaction that is possible if people are not aware of of the age range yeah so one of the misunderstandings then is that when is this going to happen when is it going to happen yeah. it was interesting one of the employees <clears throat> we were working with can you remember the hashtag awkward video mm. and one of the colleagues after they'd started talking about it um, colleagues submitted questions from across the whole of the organisation, not just menopausal women. And they'd had a couple of questions coming in saying, aren't menopausal women retired? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just goes to show that, and, and actually I think the media is a play yeah. in, in, in parts there. Generally when uh, menopause is portrayed in the media, um, it's always portrayed as a stereotypical woman. Um, so often when we're working with an organisation and we look at their demographics and they all, what one employee said we don't have many women over 55 and actually menopause the average age is 51 um, but when you think one in a hundred women can uh, menopause um, in their 40s so actually it's in their 30s isn't it 40s mm. in their 40s um, and one in a thousand women I was speaking to a, a young lady the other day who menopaused at 17 and it's not as uncommon as you think for women to menopause in their 20s or their 30s. So what is the face of menopause? Mm -hmm. um, it's often, uh, well, that's the lack of education, isn't it? That's what we want to change. Lack of awareness. Yeah. Yeah. But not only does the symptoms potentially impact on how people feel that they're working, but what is really nice to know is that work can actually um, help menopause symptoms too. So what we know is that women who are working report lower average levels of the symptoms um, of menopause than uh, women who aren't working. And this does seem to have a correlation with um, women who have more flexibility or control over their work environment. So there's a positive story there about how work really can help with the menopause. So menopause we, is good for us then. Menopause is good for us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, work's good for menopausal women. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so what we also talk about in the report is how work um, impacts menopause. So here things like the environmental conditions, so crowding, lack of ventilation, lack of access to drinking water, ability to regulate the temperature, and importantly, stress. And, and lack of ability to manage um, a, a workload has an impact, a negative impact on the symptoms. So this can make the symptoms more um, troublesome and more problematic for women. So these can be issues in the workplace that exacerbate the menopause symptoms. So what are some of the symptoms of menopause? We've said that the average age is 51. How many women experience menopause symptoms? Experience them. Three out of four women experience symptoms. One in four experience severe symptoms. So, okay, so we've got 25% of women who don't really experience any symptoms and 25% of women who really experience some quite troublesome uh, or bothersome. Bothersome is the uh, very interesting term used in the medical literature and in mm. the research literature. It's not one that we favour no, particularly. I always have to go bothersome. <laughs> because, <laughs> bothersome symptoms. Because I, I find it slightly offensive. To, yeah. But within that three quarters, three out of four women, it's quite a range, isn't it? Because I think that can be a statistic that some employers find quite scary, actually. Then I've got all these menopausal women and Three out of four of them are going to be asking me for reasonable adjustments and um, changes to the working patterns. That can actually seem quite daunting, yeah. particularly when, as we said earlier, um, the symptoms can last for a, a long period mm -hmm. of time. So when we talk about bothersome, um, actually a lot of women will experience my, uh, mild symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, women that we talk to will say, Do you know, I I'll have a few nights and I don't sleep particularly well or... Um, I get a hot flush, but actually I'm quite confident in my own body. I'll take my, uh, confident in my own skin. I'll take my jacket off and, and waft a bit. I don't mind about it. I certainly wouldn't need to do anything about it. Mm. So the range is, mm. is um, quite lengthy, isn't it? And it's really 
Absolutely. all the work we've done and the support we're putting mm -hmm. in place is for those women who aren't talking about menopause, are afraid to talk to their line manager, maybe hiding it, mm -hmm. and are experiencing those symptoms that are really getting in the way with work and life. Mm -hmm. And they do need that extra support, but not necessarily mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. And that focus is justified in that they're the individuals who need that support, yeah. but it sometimes gets portrayed as everything about the menopause is negative. Mm. And that's definitely not the case for vast numbers of, of mm. women. Mm. So I like the um, stories and also the research evidence that show that some women feel um, achieving menopause or in late stages of menopause, that they're more assertive in work, mm. that there's a new phase that opens up. We now know that you know women could spend a third of their working lives post-menopausal, which mm. is a substantial chunk of um, your career and your working time so those are really optimistic and I think that's where I love your book and um, Deborah which says menopause change for the better not oh my god it's that next thing that I've got to sort of <laughs> tackle and get through it's our sort of next phase it's something to plan for something to look forward to but I think what's got me and I didn't know this when I started doing the research was the range of symptoms mm -hmm. and this is what I think um, GPs this is what um, friends and family colleagues husbands um, just we just don't know about that there's so many symptoms and it's hard to nail down what is involved with the menopause so we make it quite clear that the menopause is a unique combination of symptoms for every woman um, and it's because it's not a predictable set of symptoms so physical symptoms we've talked about hot flushes night sweats um, difficulty sleeping palpitations achy joints um, I think, what's your favourite physical symptom that you didn't know about? <laughs> oh, crikey. Um, well, I, I, I'm not going to answer that one because I, I don't know if I could say a favourite one that I didn't know about. What I would say, though, is every session that we've run, mm. you can guarantee that somebody in the audience will say, I've got that, mm. and I've got that, and I've got that, um, and they're being treated separately. For different mm. things and sometimes it's a relief to know well, I'm not falling to bits then this is all part of menopause mm. or we have women saying actually I thought I've got Joe says it I thought I've got early onset dementia mm. um, and it's a relief to know it's menopause and I can do something about it mm. and other people have said to me I thought I'd got lymphoma um, but I was avoiding going to the doctors because all of the symptoms sort of would suggest in that way. Mm. But we have the other story, the other side, that women have been to a GP and have discussed their symptoms of being told and dismissed and said, it's just that time of life when mm. actually there's been an underlying health issue that hasn't been picked up. So again, lots of the work we've been doing with um, organisations is about providing awareness and education of the whole range of symptoms so that people are more able to ask the right questions. And we've seen really how powerful workplaces are in being able to let women know, and not just women. Um, the lady I was talking to about lymphoma, it was actually her husband who pointed it out and said, you know, it's these things seem to be happening and she hadn't really noticed. And then mm. it's mm. how, um, she ended up taking some advice and realising that it was actually the menopause. So, um, yeah, I think my favourite symptom, it doesn't happen very often, is crawling skin. Oh, <laughs> is that because I've just taken my neck? <laughs> Are you watching? <laughs> so I think some of the psychological symptoms, we often have talked to women who are on antidepressants or being treated mm. for depression because depression is a psychological symptom. But there's also that feeling of anxiety, lack of confidence, get up and go as you're transitioning to achieve menopause. Perhaps what's most unexpected then is Obviously, mood swings might make people a little erratic in their behaviour or change behaviour. But there is also the psychological symptom of irritability or aggression. And in a workplace where somebody's behaviour changes, a colleague's behaviour and the way they talk to you changes can be quite disconcerting. 
Um, and I think these unexpected symptoms are ones that if we know about them, then people can ask the right questions, start the right conversations. Uh, perhaps a more um, worrying story was somebody who exhibited hot flushes, um, foggy brain, which is another one, not being able to always concentrate intermittently and also a slightly aggressive behaviour. And the conclusion was that this person may be suffering from alcohol addiction, but yeah. in actual fact was severe um, bothersome menopause symptoms and luckily she had taken um, advice from the GP and presented that information in the workplace. So I think we've talked a lot about symptoms. I think we have. Yeah. Shall, we move on? Shall we talk on how we can ma do things to help yeah, in the workplace? Yeah, but, uh, ju just, a, just a tiny little recap. Um, we, th this is for us to start to think about why organisations and for that matter union reps need to take menopause in the workplace seriously and we have covered some things that if you're not careful people can start to think <gasps> what's coming next um you know tribunals that have been won against organizations and um, a subject matter which is a complete mystery to the majority of people this isn't just in the workplace this is a mystery to our culture to in the uk the the reason we got involved with this and we wrote the book was because the majority of women in our community were saying, I don't know enough about menopause. And actually, when you start to debunk the mysteries and um, start to explore the facts, we know from when we were um, uh, introducing the menopause policy in University of Leicester, we ran the sessions. There's a huge appetite within organisations to talk about menopause. Women the majority of women, I won't say all women want us to talk about menopause because there are those that still say, actually, I'd rather keep it to myself. I'm not really experiencing symptoms and I don't want to start disclosing personal information. But the majority of women who um, uh, we've talked to are very appreciative of this. A lot of men are. Mm. It was a landslide when we um, did that survey last year that, that where men were saying, I'd really like to know more about this. So... Um, uh, so men are interested in it. They're often husbands, brothers, line managers, We're friends, friends, whatever. They want to know about it and they are um, keen to support. And we also find a lot of um, uh, younger adults who say, actually, I think my mum's going through this and I don't really know what to do. So there's a huge appetite. The statistics can look scary. Three out of four women, what, how many? 3.5 million menopausal women in work at the moment. That can sound like it's absolutely huge. Um, but um, And the symptoms sound horrible. We don't want to start playing bingo with those, do we? And say, well, I've checked that one off and I've checked that one off. The reality is the majority of women will not be blasted with all of them, certainly not at the, at the same time. And uh, the largest part of largest proportion of women will be fine will be absolutely and develop fine. good coping strategies develop good coping strategies and come through it uh, and have um, the rest of their lives and all the missing is the periods is that right <laughs> <laughs> that's about right so um and we talked earlier about tribunals so just a, a quick recap on the things that we can do from a practical perspective both within organizations and and my experience is that the best organisations I've worked with and best project teams, there's, there's been a union rep around that table and, and that's been incredibly valuable. Um, so where do you start? How does this, how do you start to get into this conversation? Um, I would say that the, the first thing that's most important is creating the right environment to talk about menopause openly, getting everybody to talk about it confidently. And for me, confidently and openly means we usually start working with an organisation where they will use the M word. M meaning mystery, um, myths and menopause. Uh, but you'll find people will whisper the word menopause at the, uh, at the coffee machine and won't want to really talk about it openly. And we always say, let's let's decodify it. Let's just talk about it openly. And we set the, did the Sue Fish Challenge where we all say to people, say menopause three times a day until it gets to the stage where it's comfortable in your mouth. There are some interesting conversations between us. <laughs> yes, there were some interesting conversations, but actually it works. It does work. Um, it does. Just talk about it openly. And we said, 
this is two years ago, we were saying, how do you get people talking about menopause? And we say, talk about menopause. Yeah. Because as soon as you start talking about it, you'll be surprised how many people will join in the conversation. Conversations like, oh, my wife's got that. Mm -hmm. um, or conversations like that, that you might not have been expecting. Mm -hmm. And I like it that a few months down the line, suddenly menopause can be talked about in a meeting or you might say, I'm sorry, I need to open a window because I'm having a hot flush and everybody smiles or opens the window rather than everybody looking really embarrassed because somebody's just gone bright red and a roll <laughs> yeah. of sweat has landed on their paper from the end of their nose. So all of that, you know, awkwardness goes away just because it's out in the open. Yeah. And it's so easy, three times a day and quite a lot of fun. <laughs> and quite a lot of fun. So we're all in agreement that actually as soon as you do start talking about it, it does become mm. quite natural. It gets us to the point where uh, a conversation about menopause is not, is unremarkable. It's as natural as it should be and, so, and, and that's where we should be with it. And it's not a joke, it's unremarkable. And I think that's the point because sometimes it's that like sly joke or, uh, you know, it's like derogatory statement if it's out in the open and talked about it is as unremarkable as talking about yeah what you're doing at the weekend so the first thing we do is start looking at chain and um, thinking about your organizational culture and um, starting to talk about it and don't be surprised if this this takes off faster than you think it would i think that's our first question <laughs> <laughs> Can't be me. Ladies and gentlemen, can we all make sure our mobile phones are switched off? Thank you. Um, so we, we talk about um, or, or, you know, creating the right environment. And actually, a lot of that's in leadership. If you think about um, Liv Garfield, the CEO of Seven Trent, she um, won a Businesswoman of the Year recently. And she says in her um, statement that goes with that article, she says that... Um, Seven Trent is actually a fantastic place to work. It's highly supportive as an environment. Um, and she said, having the right culture, and that means talking about menopause is important. So that's um, that's mm. one that we would tick off. Um, policy or guidance documents. Do you need a menopause policy is probably a number one question that we mm. get. Uh, we heard earlier that um, uh, menopause, it's uh, put, uh, the characteristics of menopause are protected anyway under the Equalities Act 2010, that one that was 2010. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to have a, a menopause policy, but what we would say is that the most, the more important thing is actually to have um, something written down. Uh, the Faculty of Occupational Medicine do say that the majority of women do not want to talk to their line manager about menopause. Um, so it's very reassuring if something's written down so that you can see in black and white or on screen, whatever, um, what your organisation's view and approach is around menopause. And if you're going to have a conversation with your line manager, we've had women saying, I, I actually printed it off and took it in with me. It was there more as a comfy blanket. They didn't need it, but it was actually reassuring. And sometimes it might be the first that what they need to make the first step to open the conversation and talk to their line manager about it. Um, but whether it's a policy or whether it's a guidance depends on what's already in place. Uh, what I would say there is the University of Leicester have a policy because you're highly procedural, you have policies for everything else. And I think the conversation last July was if we don't call it a policy, we've completely relegated it to optional in our organisation. Whereas in an organ in Seven Trent, they don't have a policy. They have what's known as a supportive guide um, because they have a very strong well-being strategy and they have um, uh, lots of training for line managers and they don't have many policies at all mm. other than the ones that are um, statutory. So it seemed inappropriate to call it a policy. Uh, so hopefully that's um, a, a little bit of extra information. Now, even if you've got your documents in place, that's not everything. Um, the thing that's really important is getting everybody talking about this and that this needs communication and engagement on a regular basis until you've got to a point that it's completely natural and business as usual. So in that engagement process, we've done posters, um, a video, which I think we can all recite now. 
um, managers' guides, colleague guides, leaflets, mm. um, and menopause cafes. Menopause cafes, and included in that are really clear um, suggestions, guidance for line managers around what would a reasonable adjustment look like. Um, so very often the reasonable adjustments, and we've said cafeteria of approaches, are often tiny, very little expense, um, very easy to implement, might not make much difference at all to the organisation, but could make a world of difference for a woman that's experiencing symptoms. Um, and also taking a pause sometimes to say, um, if you're thinking about introducing a new uniform, if you're going to put a nylon hat on a woman, there's no way for the heat to go when she has a hot flush. So it's going to feel like a boil in the bag. So just take a little bit of extra time to say, if we're making changes, make sure that we aren't indirectly affecting menopausal women. Um, but I'm going to leave it there because mm. we just want to see if we've got any questions yeah. other than that. Because we can answer any questions on what's the practicalities of doing this. Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll put up a couple of suggestions, but um, we'll see whether there's any questions for us to answer. Um, yes, we've had a couple of questions. Um, the first has come from um, Stephen. So Stephen asks, um, line managers, how do we get them to engage? Oh, I can answer mm, that go one. Um, line managers, how do we get them to engage? What we've done for line managers before is, um, is run sessions for line managers. And it, it's an important group within the organisation because that's often the, per, the first person that the woman will have a conversation or certainly that is what we suggest the conversation should be with the woman and um, the, the line manager. Um, and one of the questions, actually, I think my, you put favourite question on there, so that's what's drawing my eye. Um, line managers, and we've had this a couple of times, have said, how can I have a conversation with a woman about menopause? I don't know anything about HRT. I don't know anything about menopause and, and actually there's a little bit of fear in there. Um, so uh, when we start to say, well, actually you probably don't know an awful lot about an epidural, but you can have a good maternity meeting and starting to explore what's the role of the line manager in that conversation, um, then you can um, equip the line manager with, generally uh, we, we tend to cover what menopause is not massive amounts of detail. We're not trying to educate them into being GPs. It is not their job to diagnose a woman and um, to, to recommend treatment. They want to know what menopause is, what's the employment law around this so that they can understand best practice, what might a reasonable adjustment look like, and most importantly, what would be, or just as important, a good what would a good conversation look like? Um, so we encourage women to have conversations around, this is what I'm experiencing, this is how it's making me feel, this is how it's affecting me at work, this is where I'd like your support. Mm -hmm. A very, very simple human uh, conversation. Um, and one of the things I would say about line managers is uh, we ran some ses sessions recently and we're, we're going to have to redo the, rerun them again because the demand's been so high. I think the word, seeing the word come along to a, um, a menopause line manager session doesn't really um, get lots and lots of people signing up. What does is when somebody's been to it and then they send around an email to their colleague saying we should all be going on this, we should make this mandatory. Um, we've had a question from Jane. Uh, Jane asks, what kind of support could I ask my employer for and how can my union support me? Okay, that's uh, quite a wide ranging question. So in terms of what, um, what support I could ask for, um, the, the kind of, uh, uh, maybe we can flick up to the previous uh, slide again, if that's possible. So the, the kind of things, depending on what symptom a woman might experience, um, uh, might be um, that you ask for a fan or cold water, um, or, or that you get moved to a different position in terms of where you sit or in terms of where your workstation is. All of those issues or all of those those um, 
adjustments. Adjustments, thank you. For, that's the right word. Um, are highly dependent on what it is that is would be useful for, for that individual. So there's no point in asking for um, gen generic um, adjustments. It has to be specific for the individual symptoms that that woman is experiencing. So in that sense, that, that is, you know, it's yeah. difficult to answer because it, it could be anything from just having a having access to cold water to having um, flexible work arrangements that are required because really bad night's sleep means that that particular woman is r focusing badly in the morning and therefore needs a bit more time and flexibility to get to work in the morning. So it comes down to symptoms and also what's their job, mm. what's yep. their role. If we think back to the um, Tiffin versus Surrey Police, the requirement was and the reason that... Um, uh, she tried. They tried lots of reasonable adjustments, but the bottom line was she needed to complete a fitness test, mm -hmm. and she couldn't. Um, so a reasonable employer will make an assessment of actually what's your symptoms, what do you need, what's the job you're doing, mm -hmm. can you still do that job, yeah. or alternatively, is there an alternative yeah. alternative yeah. role? So it's so so yeah. wide ranging. Yeah. And I guess in terms of what uh, reps can do to help, it's in having that conversation about what is required, what is reasonable in that particular job, in that particular environment, but also maybe in terms of putting together a case for something like a, a water cooler or a, mm. a fan, which in some workplaces is perhaps not taken for granted. And so having that support, not going in on your own, would be really helpful. Could we just clarify, could you repeat the question again, just to make sure that we've answered it, because... I think we focused on the symptoms. Uh, what kind of support could I ask my employer for and how can my union support me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we focused on the symptoms there and mm -hmm. I think the other thing to, to Jane's point, point is what can she expect of her employer? It, it is to lead by example and start talking about menopause and um, supported by the union rep, I would say as well. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it, it, it really does need leadership. To, to start these conversations it, it's it's better if everybody's involved in talking about menopause openly and I think that that also then what can you expect from your employer in some ways making menopause an okay conversation is just the first step it leads to other things like how do you recognize menopause in terms of absence it covers many different things, but it's very hard to tick a box to identify that you're absent because of menopause. So one of the things mm -hmm. we've spent a lot of time talking about is how can we see menopause absence as not individual illness incidents, but a long-term um, situation that's managed not as separate incidents, so it doesn't affect people's performance management and mm -hmm. such like. So in summary, in summary recognise that menopause needs to be treated seriously in the organisation, um, create the right environment, encourage conversations and put the right support in place. Mm. Um, we've had a question from Esther. Esther asks, um, can you share some more examples of good practice policy or guidance documents? Um, if possible, perhaps you could send those to us afterwards and we'll make them available yes. as well. So um, the University of Leicester policy um, document, uh, we can add that link to the resources and this we developed together and that has all of the examples of workplace adjustments written into the policy, what can be expected. It also has a document of how to start a conversation both as a um, a woman approaching a colleague or a line manager, but also as a line manager. So it's very, very straightforward um, in terms of giving lots of examples. So we're happy to share that. Yeah, that, that one's freely available, as I yeah. think the Knox Police one is. It's available on the internet. And um, what I would say is that um, every organisation is different in terms of the policy. So I think the longest one it, that we've got, that we've developed, is 17 pages and the shortest is around about three. Um, so it also, you, you have to consider what's the organisation's culture. Don't forget reasonable adjustments um, are dependent on organisation, role and what's available. So um, my, my suggestion is don't cut and paste mm. on that because what works for one won't work for another. Um, but the key headings as uh, uh, Vanessa and Andrea were just saying is what is menopause? What's our approach to it? 
um, encouraging line managers to think about um, how that conversation might be and, uh, and guidance on signposting. Mm-hmm. Where, where can more information be available would be the, the key headings. And I think in a couple of organisations I can think of, it's actually been um, women and um, interested groups on the ground who have actually taken the first steps to write an information leaflet, a guidance of what can be done in the workplace. And then that's been accepted and and taken more seriously by line managers and senior management. So it doesn't always have to be top down. It's worked very well bottom up. Uh, Jenny asks, what about shift work? How can this affect the menopause? Okay. Yep. Um, So in the evidence base, it's clear that um, stress, long working hours, um, sleep patterns all impact or can impact some of the menopause symptoms. There isn't enough information out there on shift work. Um, And that's one of the things that we're interested in looking in more detail. But what we would expect is that shift work where you cannot um, leave the workplace, frontline workers Mm -hmm. as well. These are harder environments in which to cope with some of the menopause symptoms, but certainly ones that we're looking at how you can make some small adjustments to be able to do that. I don't know if you've got more to say on this shift work. um, No, only that um, potentially it might link to the findings that we've come up uh, from the literature that we actually don't have much information about, especially blue collar and manual workers and how um, menopause experiences affect uh, women in those types of experiences. A lot of the research that has been done has been on uh, professional and office-based women. So there's a, a real need for more research in this area and, and uh, to, to bu- provide better support to women in different types of working environment. Um, Victoria asks, should managers or staff make more use of the employer's occupational health service Would you agree this would give managers and staff more confidence to ask for and make adjustments to better support staff? Right. Would I think, in terms of occupational health, I'm thinking Mm -hmm. here of um, uh, the examples, Cathy and um, uh, and Claire. I would say um, the first port of call would be the conversation with your line manager. If your line managers had some training, then ideally he would be able to understand your symptoms and um, you could have a very open conversation around what um, the individual, the, what, what the woman's doing and how they might want, she might want her line manager to help her with that. And then just with any other condition that a woman may experience or even a man might experience while they're at work and um, discuss it in that way. Um, if there are still some queries around um, what a reasonable adjustment might look like, most organisations will refer to their occupational health. Um, but um, having worked with um, uh, Cathy was saying that she had two referrals over a six week period and they were both spot on. But we know that the conversations between the colleague and the line manager were working well as well. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we'll be completely um, avoiding the line manager in the conversation. And it's really important for that working relationship that they're actually involved in that conversation. I think some people have asked the question, is occupational health just going to get overwhelmed yes. um, as we start raising awareness and educating about the menopause? And from the experience on the ground, that's not happened. There has only been two actual referrals at the University of Leicester but what has happened is that there's more confidence to talk about menopause so in in somebody who has been referred to occupational health menopause hasn't been mentioned in the initial appointment or the initial referral but has come up in conversation in um, the um, meeting that's taken place so Our other message then is occupational health isn't going to get overwhelmed as long as there is information, education and a good relationship with a line manager first. And as long as educational health is also 
part of the training and the awareness and the project raising, team, yeah. yes, so absolutely. that they have the confidence to talk about it in conversations mm-hmm. where it's not brought directly from the woman. Yeah, that's so. what we found that was quite interesting, wasn't it? Because occupational health, um, and I know what Kathy said when we were on the um, BBC Pre- uh, politics, politics show. Um, mm-hmm. The first session we had was she said, uh, "My only experience of menopause was my experience." Uh, and she really appreciated the extra education mm. on menopause because it's not something that they get through the occupational health and um, uh, professional societies mm. at this time. Yeah. Um, we've got two two kind of linked questions. Uh, the first, how can we get male union officers to engage? So obviously other than watching this webinar. Um, <laughs> and secondly, how do... Um, how, this is from Philip. Philip says, how do we male trade unionists avoid sounding patronising? I think so. That's a, they're really interesting questions. And, and it's, uh, A, encouraging to see that there are uh, men who are attending the webinar. And that's that's really good. And that's the first step. So you've ticked the first box, which is great. Um, but actually, um, trying to find more information and trying to find a way to have... Um, uh, relaxed conversations so that it isn't an awkward thing to talk about so the more information you have about the subject matter the easier it will be to have the conversation um, about it the the less of an awkward topic it will become and perhaps relatedly it's, it's quite useful to say that we've had some really very positive feedback on men um, in the workplace and uh, the support that that male line managers have provided to women. So, for example, um, I think it was your story, the, the young line manager who just um, intuitively took a woman to the window and, and to uh, uh, away from her workplace to have a, a just a chat to calm her down whenever she had a hot flush or mm. kind of give her time to to relax a little bit and that was that was seemingly done in a very intuitive manner and that was yes. that's you know it isn't that just because you're male this isn't a subject no. for you and and i believe that um uh, that there's a, a workshop being worked on for reps i mean i mean i'm i'm intrigued as um Uh, by the TUC actually so we'll let you know more um, Philip when that's available Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm I'm kind of at the point of thinking I'm not I don't know what I I suppose I'm a little bit confused why would you sound patronizing um, talking Mm -hmm. about menopause I'd say this this might be one that you might have to go with your gut and start talking about it Um, sometimes we might we, we might make a few missteps. I've done it myself. I've embarrassed somebody by talking about menopause um, in a hotel, in a bar, <laughs> um, to uh, surprise somebody completely. Um, so just use your gut, but start talking about it because um, the, the sooner we do, the sooner it'll feel more natural and we'll let you know as soon as those workshops are available. I think that's the point, isn't it? If it's visible, if it's talked about, if it's mentioned all the time, like you can talk about being a new mum back at work and you've had a sleepless night, that's an unremarkable conversation now. It's not derogatory, whereas 20 years ago, you wouldn't have mentioned that you were a new mum back at work for fear that you would have been looked at poorly. You almost left your maternal body at the door and pretended that everything was just business as usual. So we need to get to that stage where it's just normal. All of us come the whole of us and comes, human. Yeah, mm. Normal work. and human, yes. Mm. And then it can't be derogatory. Yeah. And on that note, um, to help us provide more support or help us have ideas for better support infrastructure in future, uh, we're running a survey. And uh, to our knowledge, um, this is the first time that um, a survey includes all people of working age. Mm. So this includes uh, men and it includes younger people of both genders um in terms of attitudes and values and i think the uh, the link is now up so please do participate and we will make sure that uh, a report is is kind of fed back through the system through tuc education uh, and that the resources will be made available but it'd be really good to hear your views through that survey and there's lots of opportunity there to also uh, add comments and in, in open text box not just tick boxes so Uh, Please distribute this through through your networks. Get anybody you know to participate. 
I think we should close on saying thank you very much to the TUC for talking about menopause mm. and for all mm. you're doing. Um, from a rep's point of view, we start this by saying how can we encourage people to talk about menopause in the workplace openly. Um, it's great to see what the TUC is doing and the more that we can do um, to get ourselves to a place where we've changed the culture um, and we are changing the working experience, not just for women, but also for men across the whole of the UK.